Hi, today we're going to talk about being called you. Yes, you. Gotta get my finger up here. You, you are called, called by God to be something special, to do special things. Now, when I was in seventh grade, I felt like I was nothing special, that there really, you know, what difference was I making in the world? If I hadn't been there, what difference would it have been? Uh, I hadn't done anything great. I mean, you know, I'd ridden around on my bike and played and, you know, gone to school, but nothing great. And then one time I was taking a civics class with Mr. Lightfoot. And he uh, was giving away tickets to the state teachers convention. And I thought, well, I've never been to one. You know, it might be interesting to just see what happens there. So I got one of them and went with a friend. And we get there and it's a larger auditorium in Milwaukee. And there's teachers all over the place. There's thousands of them. What was I thinking? You know, I'm waiting for one of them to set me down and give me a test. But no, they, they were busy doing their own thing and then enjoying themselves. And they even smiled a lot, which I'm not too sure teachers always do. But they, they were smiling. So I'm wandering around and there's a lot of vendors there selling uh, textbooks and things like that. And I happened to see a book on civics. Now, he had given me the free ticket to get in. He had to actually pay for it, I found out. So, you know, I thought, well, maybe I can buy this book and it can help me, you know, when we're going through some subject on government or something like that. It could give me some more information so I could talk like I'm somewhat intelligent at least. So, okay. So I bought it, and it was like a paperback book. It wasn't; a, it was pretty thick, but it was not real big. Well, I took it back and I showed it to Mr. Lightfoot to show him that you know I appreciated what he did, and he looked at it and he looked at it, and his eyes got bigger, and he said, "This textbook is great. It's got everything just the way I want it." It, I was not satisfied with our textbook we had then, so he went to his boss and got permission, which is pretty hard to do, to buy these textbooks, like for every class he taught, every student got one. So you're talking hundreds. And I thought, wow, I made a difference. I didn't mean to make a difference, but I made a difference. And that's always remind uh, Ben in my mind reminded me of just how I could be called even to do a small thing not knowing how important it was and then it turned out to be important being called is an important uh, teaching of the Christian church the Christian faith it means that as believers we're called by God to give something to this world that only each of us can uniquely give. No one else, just us can give this unique thing. We're called by God to do many things in our lives. We have more than one calling. But the final thing we want to do is bring heaven to earth for other people. You know, here's some thoughts here. Our callings in life are determined by who we are, how we live, and what we give our lives to. For example, you know a 20, you might know a 24 or 28 year old mother. And what is she? Well, she's a mother, she's a wife, 
She may have a, she has a full-time job, let's say, but yet she's a Sunday school teacher. I know people like that. In our church, I know people who are like that. So they, she has many callings as a wife, as a mother, as someone's work, whatever her work is, she's called to that. But then she's also a Sunday school teacher. A calling is not necessarily a religious thing. It's not a church thing necessarily. But we do it and use it or uh, think about it in church because God called his ap apostles and he called the believers, he calls his disciples to do things to bring heaven to earth, to bring people to faith. Okay, every person has a calling, like I just said, but they may not acknowledge it. You are not forced to do your calling. If God calls you and you ignore it, that's the way it is. We have famous uh, examples of that in the Bible. You have Paul who was told to go somewhere and he did everything he could not to go there. You have uh, Jonah. He got swallowed by a whale. You know why he got swallowed by a whale? Because he didn't want to go where God told him to go to. And eventually he's on a ship trying to escape and uh, he's in these rough seas and then he gets thrown overboard or jumps overboard and a f big fish that says got him. He tried to ignore his calling. And it's again not just people in churches and certainly not just pastors or people who are leaders in the congregation. There's people who don't believe in God, who have callings. You think of the people that may not have any uh, faith, but work in the uh, food pantry or helping out with homeless people or many other things, community things. They may be, uh, feel that they are called to work in the community uh, let's say on the school board. So there's lots of examples of that. And God calls us through each other and our calling is for each other. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? I have a copy of it here from Luke 10. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. Levites were kind of like the uh, workers in the church. So he Levite showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him, the injured man, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. Samaritans were like, don't even go close to him. Yeah, every, Jewish people hated him. Uh, if you even touched a Samaritan, you had to go and you had to take uh, special cleansing baths and everything like because you were contaminated. That's how bad it was. And here, this Hebrew man, Jewish man, is taking care of this Samaritan. He was called, called to do this. So that kind of shows you how far or how important this is. 
And we believe that all callings are guided, are guided by love. Loving God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. What's the greatest commandment? Commandments, really, two of them. Love your Lord, your God, with all your mind, heart, and soul, and strength. The second one is, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And the neighbor is not just the one who's sitting next door. The Good Samaritan story is about loving a neighbor because a Samaritan was a, was a neighbor as far as this man was concerned. Our neighbors are all these people around us and all the people in the whole world. Callings. That brings to mind a story I have when I had retired and was going to have the easy life after I had retired, I was called into uh, the pastor's office. And the pastor said, Dick, we're looking for a youth coordinator. Would you like to be that youth coordinator? And I said, well, look it, I'm too old. I'm too tired, I'm too uncool, I'm just the wrong person for that position. That was 17 years ago, and guess what I'm doing? I'm doing the youth coordinator position, although I call myself the youth guy now because it's so uncool to say a coordinator. But I had told him no. And I was walking from his office towards the front door. And I was think to my, thinking to myself, taint no way, taint no way. But somewhere in me, there was a little feeling, a little voice, I don't know what it was that said just one word, yes. Uh, before I even reached the front door, I said no again. And then that little voice said yes. So I went home and thought about it and prayed on it for a couple days. And finally I called pastor and I said yes. Because I was called. Now that's pretty unique. But I think a lot more people get something like that than they admit. You suddenly realize that you don't really want to do something. But you're going to do it. Because you're called to do it. You're being called right this minute. To something special. You really are. To be who God intended you to be when you were born. He had plans for you. You could be doing this. You could be doing this. This is really great. I remember a time when a group of us were at church. And uh, it was on a Saturday and we were working on some project. <clears throat> and a lady came in. And she said, she needed some help because she needed gas in her car so she could go to work next week. And she didn't have any money. She was broke. Well, she asked John Benson from our congregation. I don't know if you know John Benson. And John said, follow me over to Quick Trip. So they went to Quick Trip and he filled up her gas tank. Then he just came back and she went on her way. Now John did not f say, I have this great calling to go out and put gas in people's gas tanks that need it. What he did was someone came to him and he suddenly realized, here is something I'm being called to do. He felt called to do it. 
Did he continue doing that? I don't know. I really don't know. But that's how a calling is. You don't always know ahead of time. It's nothing that's really, really big. But it's something that suddenly you, you realize you are being called to do. Now, just a few reminders. Next week, Wednesday, the 28th of April, is the practice for the eighth graders for their confirmation or affirmation of conf of baptism affirmation of baptism is what it's called but it's really the confirmation service we're going to have on May 2nd uh, it's important you come and it'd be pretty good if a parent could come with you but that's not mandatory. You're going to pick out your gown. You're going to get your stole. We're going to take your picture. We have Tim Benson coming in and he'll be taking pictures. First, the class picture, which we'll make an 8x10 copy of and get to you uh, after your confirmation uh, service. And then they can be individual ones, too. <coughs> oh, excuse me. My throat is dry. Yeah, there's, uh, you can have individual ones. And uh, whatever happens, whether you print off the individual one or not, uh, we'll send you a digital copy of it. And you can go to Walgreens and have copies made. It's up to you. This whole thing, then, is free. The pictures are free. Uh, for the seventh graders, uh, this is the last confirmation class, last video, until next September. Yay! I know I can hear the shouts, the cheers, you know, maybe even from your parents' cheers. So seventh graders... It's been a great year. We've both done quite a bit of learning. So I'm really, really, you know, glad to see that you've come this far, considering some of the hurdles we've had this year, both you eighth and seventh graders. Uh, hopefully I'll see you before then. Um, church has got to be opening up within a month or two, hopefully. And I'm grateful to having such grateful people as my students, great people as my students. You're just fantastic, really. I know we don't get together and stuff like, a, like that, but we did get together for several times, and it really, really was very kind of a downer when we could not meet, because I really, really enjoy getting together with you. That's all I can say now. Eighth graders, see you on the 28th. Seventh graders, see you next September. Bye-bye.